And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the currently in development Overture RPG. The man of a th the man of a hundred sides with his hundred sided die, <laughs> the one and only Alistair Smith. How are you doing today, man? I'm not too bad, thank you. Just uh, enjoying a nice glass of whiskey on the comment about alcohol. <laughs> I'll admit a, a well good taste on that front. Um, and well, you're well, you're probably able to enjoy better weather than I am. Uh, it's been snowing here, actually, so I don't know. <laughs> it's been pretty cold. Um, I'm for the record. I'm for the record. I'm in Min I'm in Minnesota, and thus I have a very skewed definition of cold. In fact, let me see what it is. Let me read <laughs> what it is currently. Um, it's minus four Fahrenheit over here. I believe that's pretty much what we are at the moment, too. One moment. Let's just check. Uh, minus three. So, yeah. almost. <laughs> um, factor in wind chill, and it's going to feel like minus 18. It's, um, it's warmed up a little bit, but not by much. It's still in, it's still in the realm of stay the hell inside unless you're getting paid. I mean, for most people at the moment, you know, it's stay the hell in the side, even if you are getting paid, isn't it? So, yeah, um, but it could get worse. But it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, okay. walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Oh man! So my mum actually role played when she was in college so long time ago now um i remember i was probably about eight and she had the the original red box for D D, and she got it out and kind of taught me through it and to be honest i don't think we ever actually really played but it kind of sparked that interest then that then just kind of meant i tried running it with some friends at school uh, that didn't go too well and then it was probably not until i was maybe 13, something like that, and I, there was a role-playing shop where I used to live, which is mm -hmm. Cardiff, UK, um, which is called Cardiff Games, and I, I just kind of dropped in, asked if I could join in on a, on a, on a game, and that was kind of it. I, I can't remember anything that really happened except for the fact that I had dual hand crossbows. This was around the time of third edition coming out, and I jumped through a window, firing both of them at some kind of gribbly. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just... One of those things, I think it's the imagination, isn't it? Any kind of role-playing game, as long as it can capture your imagination and let you kind of a bit of escapism into another world, that's kind of what does it for me. Yeah. Dual hand crossbows. Was some, was somebody watching <laughs> The Matrix during Session Zero? To be honest, that's entirely possible. Yeah, I was a big Matrix fan, funnily enough. Yeah, I um, I was gonna guess either I was gonna guess either that or Hard Boiled, but um, on, but only people who are real who are really on the on the fringe at that on the fringe when it came to movie buff at that time we're get we're gonna be watching hard boiled or even know or even know who uh, John Woo is. I know who John Woo is. I've not seen Hard Boiled. Um, it's if you ever get if you ever get the chance I'd definitely recommend amending that. Um cool. Now when now Given that, given that, from the way from the way you said it, it sounds like um, sounds like third edition was your was your official gateway. Trial by fire, yeah. <laughs> um, it's def now in the introduction to Overture, you 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 talked about that you were working on the UAS RP RPG. That's right. Yeah, and I, I believe if I'm if I'm not mistaken, that's the that was one of the many one of the many attempts to try and bring um to try and bring elder scrolls bring to the El tabletop. elder scrolls to tabletop because lord because lord knows i trust i trust fans to do it more <laughs> than i trust bethesda to do it i mean if, if you get bethesda to do it apparently they'll just uh borrow somebody else's D, &D work and re <laughs> rename it oh god 
I, that was I some remember controversy, that. wasn't it? That that was. I would say I would say it was I would say it was a massive controversy, but it wasn't as big of a controversy as as it probably should have been, simply because Bethesda has such a long, long line of new and interesting ways to fuck up that. <laughs> It's that it's it's just at it's just adding another item on a spreadsheet by that point, especially since this was still around that time when there was some when there was something new every single week when it came to Fallout seventy six. Yeah, that's true. And because of the fact that I run a I run a I run a podcast covering news, I kept saying, "Could you not for like five <laughs> minutes so I can cover something else?" Because <laughs> every time I thought it was done, nope. Oh, Nope, we gotta we gotta go right back to it because now there's some new fuck up. You know, I think Fallout seventy six is actually the probably the only Bethesda game that I I'd never played. Because even before it came out, you could kind of tell that it wasn't gonna be that good. So, um, it's just a shame that a lot of people bought into it expecting it to be good and then were kind of cheated. May I refer you to Einstein's definition of insanity? <laughs> Because, <laughs> well, when I when I le- when I learned that they were going to be sticking to their guns with the create with the creation engine, I I was like, you can barely hold the creation engine barely holds up in single player, and you're trying to do this with multiplayer. So I I, I didn't realize this, but apparently the creation engine started off as a multiplayer engine as well, which makes it even more crazy. Yeah, well. Let's not forget that it's basically the upgraded version of the. They try and claim it's a brand new engine. It really isn't. It's just a. It's just a jumped up version of their old Gamebryo engine. Yeah. Um. But I describe it as the engine version of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. <laughs> oh. So on that note, what do you think they're going to do with the Starfield and Elder Scrolls Six with engine? Because they're saying again that that's apparently a new engine. But. I don't. I don't think. I do not. Th- if um, if Creative Assembly is going to keep insisting on using Warsmith despite its pro- despite its problems and the fact that it needs an overhaul, I expect the same thing to happen here. They're going to they're you're gonna have you're gonna have Todd Howard out, out as the whipping boy again, and he's gonna and he's gonna make a uh, claim about about details or something works. like that, and <laughs> and it's not, and um, it's 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 going to be. It's for all intents and purposes going to be the creation engine with a different with a new coat of paint, but it'll be more accurate to call it lipstick on a pig. <laughs> yeah, I guess the only good thing is that they are completely rewriting the animation engine from what I've seen. So, but the I have I haven't given Starfield or Elder Scrolls Six much thought simply because there's not a, there's not enough meat on the bones. Like once yeah, I actually fair. see once I actually see some proper some proper gameplay footage, and not and not just a fancy little tr- not just a fancy little trailer, then maybe then maybe I'll um give I'll give it some thought. But they're gonna but at least with Elder Scrolls Six, they're gonna have they're gonna have trouble with atmosphere because um Jeremy Sewell's not there. I did not actually know that he's not doing the music. Wow. No, he um. He left. He left about a year ago, more like two years ago now. But he, but he's not. He's not with. He's not with them any them anymore. And he's more or less doing uh, music independently. I'm pretty sure he's. I'm pretty sure some other game company or some other film crew is going to snap him up and eventually. You'd hope so. He's. I mean, he he is basically the reason that like Morrowind's entire atmosphere comes from its music. Mm-hmm. So. Well, it sure as hell doesn't come from its monsters. <laughs> yes, I still hate the cliff racers. I will never stop hating the cliff racers. We have a lot to thank Jaya for. <laughs> but, but um, taking taking that into account, um, what pr- what prompted what pro- what prompted the creation of Overture? So. <sighs> Obviously, the, one of the problems with UES RPG is it's it can never be anything other than a kind of slightly talked about in the dark corners of the internet game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's 
it's a setting that lots of people love, but ultimately it's a setting that is owned by Bethesda. Um, for me, I kind of I'd enjoyed working on on writing, so I, I worked on the third edition of that, and I also worked on my own version of it, which I did basically for my my own gaming group. Mm-hmm. Um, and having done that, I'd, I'd enjoyed the experience. It took a long time, but it was it was quite rewarding, especially as I'd found that other people beyond just my gaming group had actually liked what I'd done. So that kind of prompted me then to think, well, maybe I could do I could do this again and see where that goes. And it just so happened that I'd I can't come up my, with my own setting when I'd run a Pathfinder campaign mm-hmm. probably about a decade ago now. Um, and in that campaign, I'd kind of played with some of the stereotypes. Like I'd had it so a lot of the sort of typically evil D&D slash um, Pathfinder races, stuff like Knolls and whatever, were not necessarily evil or anything like that. They'd been involved in a big war and the continent was in disarray, but there were entire cities where you could go and you could kind of intermingle with those typically fringe elements of those settings. Um, and I thought, well, you know what, that, that might be interesting to play with. Um, one of the guys in the group had come up with quite a lot of interesting ideas for certain regions and had also pushed for the inclusion of things like firearms, mm-hmm. um, which obviously Pathfinder has rules for. Um, so it was easy to include for that. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I can take that that original idea and I can expand it into something that isn't necessarily just Pathfinder again. Um, the kind of result of that initially was something very different from what you currently have in version 0.4 of Overture. Um, for a start, it had a different name. <laughs> um, but the, the rule set that I initially was kind of working on, I tried to get away from percentile system. Obviously, I'd done that with UES RPG. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd come up with something that I, th- I believe was pretty similar to Savage Lands in terms of, um, or Savage Worlds rather, which was uh, different dice size based on your, your level of your attribute, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then through testing that with with a few guys, we kind of felt that it was it was too easy to get unbalanced by it. Where someone with a very high attribute is just it became almost impossible for a person with a low attribute to really counter that without doing a lot of kind of fudging of the rules to make that work. Um, it just so happened that during that time when I'd been writing the initial version of of Overture, but back when it was still called Andoran, um, I'd also picked up RuneQuest, which is another percentile game. Obviously, I'm sure you're aware of that. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I'd somehow completely managed to miss the existence of, Ru- of RuneQuest. I don't know how I've managed to do that. I've been role-playing for, what, 20, 24 years, something like that now? And, uh, yeah, I'd never heard of it. Um, <laughs> so I picked it up. I introduced it to my, my regular group. Uh, we've been very much enjoying it, running a long campaign of that now. Um, but it then made me think, well, maybe I can go back and I can do a percentile game that is a bit simpler. Because one of the biggest issues that my group and I imagine a lot of other people find with percentile games is that they tend to get quite clunky. You have like you think about Death Watch, it's degrees of success mechanic. Suddenly you've got to count your tens and work out exactly how many full tens you are mm-hmm. away from what you rolled. Uh, what, sorry, what your target number was. Um, or Warhammer Fantasy with its degree uh, success levels and they can be plus or minus and again it's kind of a similar kind of concept and there are ways you can get kind of get around those but i still wanted something that was simple enough that you can kind of just look at your character sheet and kind of say okay if we're all below this then this happens if we're all below that then that happens mm-hmm. um which led into some of the mechanics choices that i have made in overture around proficiency and aptitude and then just luck, which kind of gives you your three kind of main levels of success um mm-hmm. i also wanted to avoid dream quests idea of your level of success being being based on a percentage of your current value because again that's maths that either requires you've got to have a table in front of you at all times to compare the particular thing that you're doing or you need to be very good at mental maths Mm -hmm. which i mean to be fair like one of the guys in my group you ask him a number and he'll tell you what five percent twenty percent of that number is within like milliseconds he just knows but then most of my group, including me, to be honest, a lot of the time, it will take me long enough that it would really slow the game down. 
Mm -hmm. So I wanted to avoid that, basically. Yeah, I can I can definitely get that. And when it when the whenever it comes to percentile die, I've all I've off and this is a debate I've seen people swing back and forth on over the years. Um, mm -hmm. There's always there's always this debate about whether or not um, a percentile based system is too swingy. And I'm I'm curious how you feel how you feel about that particular claim and whether or not you th whether or not you think it's um it's a case of a game a game being too too harsh on the on or on um on low level odds or do you th or do you think there's something else that makes the perception that D100 is swingy? So I mean, when I think of swingy, I tend to think of. Uh... I don't really think a percentile games are swingy because when you get down to it, even D and D, you, you know, you, you typically have a, a sort of set percentage of success. Obviously, you think about Pathfinder. If you're not a warrior type character, Pathfinder Two is a good example of it. Actually, warrior characters have, I think, it works out as around a sixty-five percent chance of success against a, an appropriately leveled enemy, and everything else has a lower percentage than that. Um. At, that might be slightly out. It might be something like seventy percent, and then lower for everybody else. But either way, it's still when you actually look at people working out the numbers for those games. Ultimately, they still always go back to percentages. And when I think about it from that perspective, it's no different from just rolling a percentile dice, except for the fact that percentile dice lets it be more granular, which allows more opportunity for things to manipulate those dice. Mm -hmm. Um. I say that the way that I kind of have gone with it with my favor and fall mechanic does effectively work out as 5% increases and decreases. So you theoretically could say the favor and fall is equivalent to plus one, minus one, I guess. So I could, I could definitely, um, I could definitely see that. I think, I think, um, I've, I've always have the, I've always had the mindset that the, that the reason why people accuse it of swingy is, and this is especially the case in something like, say, um, Warhammer Fantasy, mm -hmm. the start the starting values are are pretty low. Like I'd I'd say I'd say um, for a lot of starting characters, their core ability scores are in the th are in the thirties and forties. Yeah. So one of the things that I've done with Overture is pretty easy to. I, I do have a hard cap. You can't start with anything over 69. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was almost accidental, to be honest, that it ended up being 69. Obviously, I know you got the 69 dude jokes and things like that, but it That's was... Um, easy. Exactly, yeah. Um, having said that, every week in my role-playing group, that will come up at least once. So um, one of the things I did do, though, it's, it's pretty easy to get to that 69% in sort of whatever it is that you want to be good at as a character. So you're, you know, from the outset, the things you want to be good at, you're probably about as good at as a Pathfinder warrior would be, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, there will be a lot of things that you're considerably worse at. Um, and there will be some things that your chances of success are almost non-existent because you've put no points at all into it. But... I think I'm probably more generous than a lot of other systems in terms of the amount of points that get put into things at the start. I am also aware of the fact that I have a lot more skills than a lot of other games. Um, I went pretty granular with it just because I always find... Uh, just taking D&D 5th Ed, for example, you want to know how much you know about an area. Good luck. There's no geography skill anymore. There was oh, an yeah. earlier edition, but they got rid of it in 5th Ed. And yeah, you they, can they got rid history of it. Yeah. Or whatever, but... It, they got rid of it, and then, and then they put in, oh, we left it blank so that people could come up with it, because it's all about the story. Which is fair. You know, narrative is really important. Um, there is a reason why, even in Overture, I do call out the fact that when you're making a character, there are two sides to that. There is the mechanics, which are important, but there's also your concept, and that's really key to any character in any game. Yeah. Um, ultimately, I think a role-playing game should be... The role play is really important because what's the point? Otherwise, you might as well play a board game. But equally, the game is still there. And I think 
game role playing games that don't bother with much in the way of rules content and uh, for almost becoming more like you're, you're just kind of uh, having a an impromptu drama session with friends, which which is cool. For some people that's that's exactly what they want, and there are a lot of systems that do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I kind of prefer slightly more simulationist games, which I think Overture probably leans more that way. Um, my role playing group, we do a mix. We've played Fate, we've done Dresden Files, things like that. Um, but then we've also done we've done Numenera, which is pretty rules light as well, all things considered. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we have done things like Warhammer Fantasy, Death Watch, Rune Quest, Shadow, even Shadowrun, which is obviously dice balls, but it's still quite rulesy. Yeah. So um, the reason why I s- <clears throat> the reason why I said that whole all about the story thing with the tone that I did is. <laughs> I do I do think that some de- that some designers um use it's about the story or it's a or um it's about being si- or, or we need to make it simplistic um as a crutch. Yeah, I would agree. I think yeah, uh, it's narrative is really important. I as I said, I think if you don't focus on it you kind of lose the point of playing a role-playing game in the first place. However, if you use it as an excuse for not providing ways to handle things, all it does is it slows things down for them, the group, because suddenly they go, oh, what do I know about the area? And the GM's got to be like, well, give me an intelligence role because it's D&D and I have no other skill to use for it. Mm-hmm. Whereas realistically, a character who's maybe spent a whole, whole bunch of time story-wise studying geography and learning about the, the lands that they maybe want to explore in the future, probably should get bonuses. You could maybe give them advantage in D&D, I guess. Um, but then advantage is comparatively a very big bonus compared to your sort of level of proficiency. It's the equivalent to a level 15-ish character in D&D, because it'd be the equivalent to a plus five. Yeah. And when now, when it comes... Now, um... When it comes to overture, yep. Some another <clears throat> another aspect that it, that is often se- is often seen is some is some sort of extra effort system. Um, Warhammer has fortune. Um, Shadowrun <laughs> has fa- Shadowrun has fate. Um, RuneQuest has luck. Um, Walk me through the can walk me through your own your own approach when it comes to an extra effort system if you or and if you and if there isn't one um what was the reason that you didn't put it in there is one um so on the topic of runequest it's interesting because i'm playing uh, my group we're playing rune play runequest role playing in glorantha mm-hmm. which doesn't have that option for the luck i know that's one in mithras and or runequest 6 as it was previously but yeah it it never made it into their when they re-released effectively second edition. So, um, but yeah, I have uh, a mechanic. I call it pushing your luck. It's pretty similar in kind of concept. So, the idea is, uh, I suppose I'll take a step back. Luck is an attribute for all, all characters. It's four for anyone that isn't human, five for humans. Mm-hmm. Um, luck determines your chance of getting a critical, but also determines your chance of fumbling. So, the higher your luck. So if you've got a five, then you've got a 5% chance of a critical and you've got a 5% chance of a fumble. If you've got four, like most most species do, then you've got a 4% chance of a critical, but you've got a 6% chance of a fumble, effectively. Um, pushing your luck, what that does is for the rest of the session, you reduce your luck by one, but it does let you re-roll the check. So it's it's pretty much the same general concept, I think, as I'm trying to remember. Does RuneQuest Six's luck work similar to that? I think it does. Uh, although I know that in that it's luck points based on uh, a, a calculation based on your luck score. I think, mm-hmm. but uh, and I can I can definitely see I can definitely see that. I know. I know some people don't like the idea of having a extra effort system because they prefer the they prefer the die have be um, fairly predictable. So that's why I did it the way that I did it. I wanted to have it so that 
it's a, it's an actual trade off because by pushing your luck, you're reducing your luck for the rest of the session, which then means your chance of criticals go down. Uh, the other thing that it also impacts is your aptitude. So your aptitude is your chance of getting a special success as well in the game, um, which is basically derived from one or two attributes plus your luck. Mm-hmm. So any time that your luck goes down, suddenly your chance of getting good results and your chance of getting a really bad result go up for the rest of the session. Um, so I wanted to, that was kind of was key. I didn't want it to just be, okay, you, you've got a re-roll and you can do that X number of times. It's you've got a re-roll, you can do it X number of times, but each time that you do it, you're having a negative impact on your character for the rest of the session. So whether it's worth it or not then becomes questionable. Mm-hmm. Um, pushing your luck, I also have a, a kind of linked mechanic to that, which is pushing the narrative, which I think a few other games do something similar. The idea is that you might want to nudge the the, the way the story is going to, to help you out. Uh, the way that works in in overture is say you're you've run out of torches you're deep below the earth and you obviously most characters can't see in the dark um it's not it's something else that i've not done and like say again D D is a good example where light is tri- kind of trivialized by basically every every race in in that having dark vision in this pretty much nobody does so you run out of torches you're kind of screwed um you might then say, well, as a group, we'll all reduce our luck by one. But we we, we realize, oh, actually, either maybe you find a torch or actually one of your members, you, you still got one in your pack. Mm-hmm. Another example might be something like, say, you're running away from from enemies in the middle of a city. Let's say you're being attacked by some street thugs. And you might say you want to do a nar- push the narrative to say that uh, a street vendor pushes their their sales cut out in front of your, your pursuers. So again, that would be the cost there is that everybody's luck goes down for the session, which actually, obviously, for a human, puts you down to the level that a non-human would normally be, and for everybody else, it puts you down even even lower. Yeah. Um, but again, it's tying back to that conversation about, around narrative and rules. I wanted to make sure that any kind of exertion type me- mechanic where you can you can retry effectively i also allowed to have an impact on narrative situations as well mm-hmm. i think that's nice because it allows your uh, your players to be creative and come up with interesting ways to impact the story and gives them a, a bit of a sense of control because ultimately it's meant to be a shared experience not just the gm railroading you through events yeah now when it com- when it comes to when it comes to the um, o- the occupation system that you ha- that you have, which, mm-hmm. for all intents and purposes, de- is is the closest thing that you have to a class in this. It's just that the cl- it's just that it's more of a starting package than a typical D and D class, where it's your um, general pathway throughout your entire adventuring career. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one of the th- one of the things I was one of the things I was um curious about is when it com- is um w- did you de- did you design these the setup with um both both um occupation and with spe- and with species with the idea in mind that these are basically the starting points and then you're giving then you're giving um players a wide sandbox exactly yeah um so obviously having previously ran UES RPG mm-hmm. There were two pieces that I kind of learned through that. One, some players will be frozen for choice in a game where there is no class equivalent. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly in my group, there were a couple of the players that needed quite a lot of help to build a character because they couldn't quite work out from all the choices they had um, how to go about that. Um, Equally, there there are obviously some people that will thrive on the opportunity to just go, cool, I can pick any combination of skills and abilities that I want. Wicked. I'll, I'll, and they'll go away, they'll come up with something crazy, come back and they look what I've made, I broke your game. Um, <laughs> but one of the other things then was, just to, as an example, one of the players made a, a Khajiit merchant. He had no combat abilities at the start of the game. He'd gone all in on the, this concept that he'd been the favoured son of a, a merchant family, and then 
spent his entire life doing that until his uncle had gotten jealous of him and tried to kill him, so he had to flee. Yeah. Over the course of the campaign, because it's completely open and you can you can kind of improve whatever you want, he went from that to being a sort of hotshot archer with a little bit of healing magic on the side um, and a very influential mental influential member of the party as a result uh, and it was one of the pieces of feedback that i always had from that game was the people that had their characters grow based on their narrative the way that the story had gone really loved it which i think in a class-based game you know once you choose your class your options are maybe multi-class and games that allow it or this is your character for the rest of the story which again my group, and I think quite a lot of other groups, probably like to play games that are fairly long-running. Mm-hmm. And if you tie yourself into a concept and then realize after you've been playing it for a while that actually it's not quite what I want, your choices are basically then, again, maybe multi-class, but you're in a lot of games going to find that that severely limits your usefulness or make another character. Um, I've done both of those things in other games myself. And I wanted Overture to had the idea that these starting packages, all they are is some guidance on the kind of characters you might make for the setting. But after that, grow them however you want based on the way your story is is progressing. It might be that your mage ends up in a position where he spends a lot of time having to fight because something he keeps finding himself low on mana for some reason. Mm -hmm. So he starts training with a sword. Maybe one of the other characters in the group is a warrior and you then have the whole concept that they're, they're teaching teaching that mage how to fight. Mm-hmm. And that's perfectly viable. You can do that, and the mage can eventually be just as good a warrior as the warrior. Um, similarly, though, the, the warrior could decide, well, I want to learn some magic from that mage while I'm at it, and the mage can teach him some elementalism or mysticism or whatever, and you can progress both characters in that way. Um so yeah, that's that's kind of the reasoning behind the starting packages. I do also have um, one of the occupations, the adventurer, is intentionally completely open for those players that I kind of described earlier, where they will look at it and go, okay, I don't want to use any of those those examples. I want to just do my own thing. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. Be an adventurer. That basically just gives you a set of bonuses that you can assign to any skills that you like and the freedom to take any talent that you like as well mm-hmm. keeps it pretty straightforward um in some ways it's not quite as powerful because the sort of signature occupation talents that the main occupations will get are intentionally quite good mm-hmm. um because they're obviously meant to represent the key thing that a particular occupation does like assassin has has an assassinate ability the um barbarian has a berserker ability you know there's a things you'd expect before you even look at any detail if you read assassin you expect them to have some kind of ability that lets them be good at assassinating when you think barbarians you think of someone who can go into a rage Mm -hmm. um so those kind of things exist um but then yeah as i say adventurer they can just they have the freedom to make whatever they want which theoretically means a really canny or savvy player might be able to come up with something that is technically better for whatever specific concept they want than any of the existing occupations would let them do. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it when it comes to um, combat, mm-hmm. since given the kind of game that this is, obviously that's going to play a major factor. Um, what's what is the level of lethality that you were trying to aim for? Were you tr- were you trying to aim for the role master level of lethality, where one good crit is all is all that it takes to to down somebody, or are you aiming for something a little more forgiving? Somewhere in between, yeah. Um, don't get me wrong; something that's really dangerous that attacks a character that doesn't have, say, good armor or good other protections, potentially could one hit them. You get hit by a dragon, for example. Yeah, there, there is a, a decent chance that that could could one sh- one shot a character, um, but that's because I those kind of enemies shouldn't be trivialized. Um, an inspiration for the combat system is is the sort of Dark Souls kind of games where a thing that's important is choosing how to react to the different kinds of attacks you get. Um, I know that that's nothing unusual in uh, percentile games in particular, where 
you do opposed rolls. Uh, that that is the way that this game works as well. Um, but I would say that the lethality is not as bad as RuneQuest. I am painfully aware of the fact now that, say, a Sakaar, which is a saber-toothed cat, basically can quite casually kill a character in one one turn. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's unlikely that any character is going to just go down in, in a single turn in, in Overture, but it's dangerous enough that you're never going to feel like you're unstoppable. Um, the way that I kind of describe it is it's a game about gritty heroes rather than necessarily a game the sort of more high fantasy heroes that you maybe have in D&D. Mm-hmm. Um, would you say, would you, in that regard, would you say that it that it would have more in common with the heroes seen in a sword and sorcery work? Yeah, that's fair. And something, something I did, something I did notice mm-hmm. is in regard to spells, um, first off, the spe- the um, the cer- sometimes fantasy games can have and can have the issue of spell bloat, where the list of spells is so large that it ends up giving less <laughs> space for other materials. Yeah. Whereas, whereas I don't see I don't see that as much in th- in this case, and. Do you do you suppose that part of that is due to the fact that you're si- that you're um well f- obviously the game is still obviously the game is still in active development but the fact that you've treated magic as a d- as sets of skills instead of instead of a whole other column like some others do yeah um so my intention is that there probably won't be more than around 20 maybe 25 spells per skill which is still more than you'll ever be able to learn as a character um so the way that the rules funnily enough i've actually done an update to to the rules after some conversations with playtesters over the last few days um where previously i had it so that just the simple act of ranking up your your spell skill uh, for whichever one say elementalism would teach you a new elemental spell I've now taken that away purely because it did spellcasters had an unfair advantage over non-spellcasters that I didn't want. Um, so instead, now you'll have to buy spells the same as a warrior would buy their weapons and things. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the the intention is that there should be enough spells that every magic skill has choices, and so that potentially every magic user will have different spells for even if they use the same magic skills. But I don't intend it for it to be probably more than, as I say, 20 to 25 spells per magic skill. Incidentally, the most that you could ever learn for a particular magic skill would be 14 spells if you took the appropriate talent. Mm -hmm. And I I, um, I also see... Also, I noticed that, of of course, um, a lot of the magic talents... Could could um qualify for meta could qualify for being meta magic in um, Pathfinder Third Edition. Yeah, that's that's fair. Um, the way that I kind of try to treat the talents is they are ways of changing. Either they just flat out make you better at using a particular skill, uh, not necessarily through a flat bonus, although some of them do provide favor. Mm-hmm. Um, however. In most cases, the idea is that the talents should provide you new ways to use that skill. So, um, I'm trying to think of an example. A, a, an example would be the medicine skill. There is a talent for healing hands, which basically lets you actually heal hit points via a first aid roll. So, first aid normally would let you stop bleeding and might let you do things like neutralize a poison and that sort of thing. Um, with a talent, you can. The idea is because typically characters that do the the healing will also have some magical ability, and every th- everyone in the setting is meant to have some innate magical talent, even if they never use it. Um, the idea is though that those those healers that ha- find a way to use that magical ability to do more than just staunch bleeding, but also potentially start to re-knit the wounds a bit quicker, that sort of thing. Plus, it makes it so that characters are a little bit more survivable, potentially. Oh, yeah, I can, de- I can definitely, um, I can definitely get behind that. 
now when given given some given some of your influences i'm get, i'm guessing that something you did something you wanted to at least wanted to avoid to a degree is the um the requirement chaining that could happen with feats back in path back in pathfinder and D&D yeah there there are a couple of talents that do require another talent first but they are fairly infrequent for example i think uh, i've got got one to do with melee weapons which is uh battle tempo and that is how you get extra attacks in, in this so you don't get the ability to just make multiple attacks with any weapon you've got you the idea is once you've gotten skilled enough with a particular weapon you can potentially make multiple attacks with that weapon so yeah just just double checking that the actual order that the talents go in i had them the wrong way around you have follow-up attack which lets you make an extra attack as a minor action and then your battle tempo, which lets you make an extra attack as a free action, but the key, but there is the caveat in that that you have to have hit with the previous attack each time. So your first attack is an action. If that hits, you make a second attack as a minor action. If that hits, you make a third attack as a free action, mm-hmm. um, which is a bit more realistic to the way that real world sort of comboing or attacks work. Mm-hmm. It's less about, you know, if you want to do something where you're fainting and then attacking, you can do that. There are rules for doing that as well, but making a series of attacks is typically not you miss you miss and then you attack it's you attack and you've hit you can that's now pushed them off guard you hit them again they're now stumbling back and then you hit them a third time with the opening that you've created mm-hmm. so that's kind of what those are supposed to represent but generally speaking yes the the talent system is is more open and you can kind of take them as long as you meet the requirement you can you can take them in any order yeah and especially and given the fact that it's st- that it's still ex- that it's still experience based instead of instead of a uh, slot based approach, um, I don't think I don't think there's going to be as much choice paralysis in this case, as opposed to fe- as opposed to feats normally where you where you're only going to get that one chance at a f- at a feat for that level and then you're going to have to wait a while or do or do a full respec. Yeah, um, progression. The idea is that you can, you kind of have multiple options when you're when you're improving. You might be you might improve your HP, your mana, or your or your stamina, mm-hmm. all of, all of which are important for all characters. Mana is even important for warriors. I've not finished the rules for it, but the the idea is magic items require you to actually reduce your mana pool for the duration that you're attuned to magic items, uh, which incidentally will also have the fun impact of meaning that mages probably don't carry many magic items because they keep their mana free for actual spell casting. Mm-hmm. But it does mean that warriors have a reason to actually have the stat rather than just being a, a throwaway like it might be in, in certain other games. Like, funnily enough, US RPG, where the warrior just goes, oh, I don't need don't need magicka. Yeah, and I, I understand why it's done in why it's done in those instances, but I do, but I do think that 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 it doesn't I've never been a fo- never been fond of the idea of dump stats. Likewise, oh. I completely agree. <laughs> the The ultimate case in point when it comes to that is um, charisma. <laughs> I knew you were going to say it as well. <laughs> yeah, or whereas dexterity is the opposite in in D twenty games, isn't it? Where dexterity is too useful. Yeah, I agree. Because um, e- even if somebody wants to do the slow tanky type, they still they still need some degree of dexterity because. They're, because they're get, they're going to they're going to be needing that just so they can, just so they can get a de- so that they're not acting dead last during turns or praying to the dice gods that they roll a twenty. So I don't know if you've played Pillars of Eternity. I ha- I haven't I just I have it I just haven't gotten around to <laughs> delving into it. So I played the first one. I haven't I own the second one, but but similarly I've not actually got around to playing. I always have a massive backlog of computer games to play, but. Um, one of the things that that game did, which I've always appreciated, is the the concept of all your attributes are relevant regardless of the character. Um, the way that they're relevant will change, and mm-hmm. it's true still that certain attributes will be more or less relevant in different for different kinds of characters. But there should be at least some relevance to all characters for all attributes. Um, I've tried to do that with Overture. Personality is still an issue. Because, as a concept, personality still has a far more limited 
uses for a lot of scenarios. Having said that, um, I am still trying to work on ways to make it more useful. Mm -hmm. Um, But one of the things that I have done, though, is certain attributes impact your derived attributes more than others. The ones that impact your derived attributes less tend to impact your skills slightly more, i.e. they're seen in more of the skills. So intelligence and um, agility aren't really used in your derived attributes much at all in Overture. However, they appear in quite a lot of your skills. Um, Whereas by comparison, something like uh, your body stat, so it's pretty much the same sort of concept as constitution in D&D, for anyone that knows that. Um, It's it's not used in anywhere near as many of the skills. It's still used in some of the skills. um, And in some cases, it's very important skills. So I still have the the the, the rough equivalent to your fortitude, uh, wisdom. Sorry, fortitude, will, and reflex saves in Overture would be they're just skills because everything is handled by skills. Um, but you've got your discipline, which is effectively your ability to resist mental effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it might also come in for other situations as well. You've got your uh, resilience, which is your you know, it's how hardy you are, how how likely you are to overcome something like poisons, and then you have got your um, your evasion, which is your effectively your getting out of dodge stat mm-hmm. um, or skill. Um, there's also might as well, which will come in for some things as well. Yeah, and when it when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, skills. Mm-hmm. Was there was there a was there a consi- was there a um, consideration about making about making sure that skills didn't get too bloated themselves? Is, uh, how do you mean? As in the individual skill didn't do too much, or as in just as, the number of skills in general? Um, a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. The um, an ex- two ex- um. The big example I I always think of when it comes to when it comes to blo- when it comes to skill bloat are some of those really skill heavy games that ca- that came out in the early '90s where there were just pages upon pages of skills that had very specific use and subtypes of skills that you that you that you all needed to put a limited amount of points into. So, with Overture, I. I, I'm not going to lie for any, for anyone that decides they want to have a look at it. It's uh, comparative to something like the, again Dungeons and Dragons, specifically fifth edition. It's got a lot more skills. Um, I can't actually remember how many third edition or three point five had, but I know that it had it had quite a few. Um, the other I think, the other thing the other thing is um is not is not just sk- not just skill not just um the number of skills but <clears throat> their use. Um, yeah. And the, and a, a lot of sk- a lot of skills in I'd say I'd say in um in something like D in, in something like D and D for instance specifically um D and D third edition this was slightly improved in Pathfinder though not not enough in my opinion is ha- is having a is having a bunch of skills that are far too specific like is it I don't. I remember asking, even in the early days, is it really necessary to have a separate skill for running, jumping, climbing, mm-hmm. and using rope? So Overture does actually have a separate skill for running, climbing, and jumping. Um, <laughs> on that note, mm-hmm. so I think yes is the answer, purely because just because you're athletic doesn't necessarily mean that you're good at all those things. Um, I suppose, someone I suppose someone better. who trains in jumping is much better at jumping longer distance than someone who do, never bothers with that but is really good at doing, yeah. say, your 100 meter sprint. Um, so I think it's it's important for them to be separate skills, so long as there's also uses for those skills. Mm-hmm. Um, what I didn't want was to have the idea that just because you're good at athletics, you're good at everything that is athletic. Um, Having said that, the way that NPCs work in the game does simplify things a lot into uh, even more streamlined than than just athletics. You literally, for NPCs, typically they'll use the, the skill groups. So they have a general awareness value, they have a general knowledge value, magic value, manipulation value. 
physical value, social value, stealth value, etc. So um, theoretically, I imagine a house rule a house rule I could see people maybe using with Overture might be to have players just do the same thing. For people that really don't like the idea of having the more granular skills. Um, but my view is that having them be more granular allows for more things to key off them and also for characters to specialize a bit more. It means that you can have two very athletic characters that go in very different ways. You might, like you think about your thief roof runner; they're probably pretty good at jumping, pretty good at balancing. They might also be good at climbing, but they how good they are at running really depends on how good they are at sneaking. Because if they're good at sneaking, they've never really needed to run that much. Because mm-hmm. actually, running is probably a, a, the anti- antipathy of what they need to do, which is be quiet. So, yeah, it, it's one of those things. I think. It's 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 an interesting debate. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm totally interested to actually hear your thoughts on why putting them together would be the right thing to do. Um, but certainly in Overture, at the moment, I have got them separated. Um, they are keyed off slightly different attributes for different things as well. So let's just open my book and have a quick look. So I can't remember everything offhand. I think. I I think th- I think the reason that I don't have as much of an issue with it in Overture compared to when I had an, had an issue with it in um, D- in D and D is is a is because is how it's used. Now the the skill sy- the the um skill system in your in your case every every sk- every skill is going to have its base percentage based on. Um, around two, around two or so at at least two attributes, some some cases some cases three. That's right. Yep. Whereas, and and I should note the other the other factor is the is the way skill the way skill advancement works, where it's not it's not a it's not a um set, it's not a set of 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 points based on this one attribute. You know, the I'm specifically referring to the whole skill points formula in um in the d20 system yeah whereas in this case you do have you do have the incremental advances but <clears throat> i think something that works in in your favor is the is the fact that you don't have the you don't have the rate of skill advancement skewed towards cer- towards certain archetypes um like if some if somebody was playing a fighter in D in D and D, they'd get a mere pittance of um sk- of skill points, unless they had a really high intelligence. Which, um, if you're trying to optimize, you you may end up using intelligence as a dump stat. Yeah. In this per- in this particular case, because of how interconnected the attributes are, there's not as much opportunity for that dump stat, and because of because of the fact that it's relatively freeform. Um, you don't have that. You don't have that discrepancy when it comes to um, skip. When it comes to allocating skip um, skill advancements, if and if anything, the if there if there is a if there is a limited pool for skill advancements, that's probably because that experience is being spent elsewhere, and that's a player situation, not a um, not a design situation. Yeah, exactly. The other thing with skill advancement in Overture that I I kind of did was I have it so that so to basically to improve your a skill you it costs one experience mm-hmm. per session. My current recommendation is that the game should you should be getting between two and five experience, which is enough that therefore you can improve five skills potentially every session. Um, if you improve a low skill, your chances of improving it are massively higher. So the basic way that it works is you roll your percentile dice, you add your current aptitude value to that, and if it's higher than the current value, then you get one increase. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when I say one increase, I don't mean one point. I mean there are, there are two columns. Um, there's a table for it. If you roll lower than your current value, then you get a different increase. So actually improving skills you're not good at is very easy because, one, you're more likely to roll above it, and the lower the skill is, the more points it increases by each time that you spend an experience point on it. The higher it gets, it does start to get to the point where it's not as easy to improve it, which is, again, you think about real world, it's very easy to learn the basics of something. It's even potentially quite easy to get 
half decent at anything that you put your mind to mm -hmm. but genuinely being someone who's noticeably good at something takes takes real effort and that's kind of the way that the system is set up to to work so what i'd expect to see is most characters will end up having a fairly good number of skills that they are pretty good at and then they'll have a smaller selection of skills that they are really good at um at the moment, I haven't included any kind of option for using your pushing your luck on those skill advancement roles, although theoretically, I guess you could. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, just as an example, say a character has got currently got a a forty five percent chance on their jumping, and they choose to spend an experience point, and they roll they're all twenty, but they've got an attitude of say sixteen. So it's 36, so they'll get one point improvement. If they rolled a 40 and added the 16, so it's it's higher than their current value, um, they'd get a three point increase. Which obviously, when you think about the, just the sheer percentage side of things, that means that lower skills are almost improving at a D and D style plus one, potentially for multiple skills every single session. Mm -hmm. And your higher skills are going to take a few sessions to get the, the equivalent to a D&D plus one, which I think is still overall probably better advancement than you get in something any, any of the sort of level-based games. The other thing is it really allows players to have control over how they advance. So one thing, playing Rune, RuneQuest uh, role-playing in Glorantha, the way that one works is you take a skill... And then at the end, when you get told it's time to advance, you make a roll for each skill, and you may or may not improve it at all. So you have no real control over it. You used it, so it's a bit it's a bit Elder Scrollsy, I suppose, in that you actually use it, except for the fact that you just you can just get unlucky and roll really low, and then that means you go, oh well, no improvements at all. So even if something's a really low skill, the net result is that your character just doesn't get better, which is a bit dissatisfying. Whereas I think giving players the ability to say, okay, I've got three experience this session, I'm going to improve these two skills and maybe save a point to go towards getting something else next next session. Um, they can choose two skills that they are currently bad at, but maybe they've used, or they could choose two skills that they're really good at that they maybe didn't use. It doesn't really matter. It's entirely player choice at that point. Um, but they will also be aware of the fact that choosing the ones they're not so good at will be considerably easier to actually improve than the ones that they are already good at. But again, yeah, it's it's the player choice element on that. Um, and it also keys into the whole thing around, I, essentially, you should be improving every single session rather than it being wait a few sessions, then improve, wait a few more sessions, then improve, or potentially, I mean, I don't know about you, but there are, there are, I've played in games where you might wait 10 15 sessions before you level up in a level based game. Mm -hmm. So, and something else that I that I think works in your favor is the fact that with occupations you have a starting package that you that you can work around. Whereas, it, whereas other in not to, not to keep knock not to keep knocking on um, D20, but it was never designed <laughs> with a with a skill system in mind. You ha you have a case of the. The skill the um, skill system in that one being a blank slate and just saying here's a bunch of points spend spend them where spend them wherever um and it's the the term I like to use for that is um swim damn it um referencing Jeez. a referencing a, a penny arcade a old penny arcade strip that w that was that was about that when it came to when it came to just stop asking questions and just get in the pool. Which is not <laughs> yeah. the best way to teach people how to how to do something, especially when um, when a lot of games that like to claim that they're free form or have or have lots of choices, in rea in reality don't have as many as they'd like to boast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, it, it comes back to that conversation we had earlier around player choice, player freezing because they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when when Someone who's played a lot of role-playing games will typically have a rough idea on the kind of things they'd expect a character of a certain type to be good at. Players that are newer to role-playing games are less likely to have that, 
but then you also have players that are more experienced but only have experience playing class-based games and i think that that is probably a downside to overture in that there are quite a lot of there are a lot of skills which means there is a lot of choice um and what is right and what is wrong is potentially harder i suppose um but yeah that that is exactly the idea behind occupations it kind of says okay well you want to play a warrior cool here's the warrior occupation it gives you these bonuses to all these skills it gives you these bonuses to these skills and these bonuses to these skills and here's a here's a cool talent that makes you better at doing the thing you'd expect warriors to do which obviously is fighting mm-hmm. um that gives the player enough to kind of start not have to spend too much time thinking about it they can just kind of jump into it um Obviously, doing it all by hand takes a bit of time, but one of the things that we, we've been doing kind of behind the scenes a little bit is working on, a, for now, an Excel spreadsheet, character sheet, that will do pretty much all of the, the sort of calculating of your occupation and your uh, culture together to work out what your, your initial sort of skills will be. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually, I'll, I'll probably make that into a PDF, but as in a PDF that does it for you, kind of like... Um, <laughs> Again, D and D, but uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the more purple, more better character sheet. Um, yeah, I, ha- I have, and I've have seen more, I've seen more than my fair share of um, of fill of fillable and auto calculating um, character sheets. Because hmm. um, obviously, with the way I hand with the way I handle reviews, I have to um, I have to fill in an example character, and some and sometimes I have to do that manually using using. F- Using GIMP, and I don't, <laughs> and I don't like doing it that way because I am not an artist. So, uh, on that question, uh, out of interest, have you had a look at the character sheet? The ex- the Excel one, mm-hmm. I ha- I have. Um, <laughs> it's um, it's about what I it's about what I kind of expected, is one is one way to put it. <laughs> It's um, it's def it's definite it's definitely it's definitely on it's definitely on the rougher end of the spectrum. That's 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 not a slight. It's just no, I, no. It's it's when, useful to to get actual feedback. So yeah, when it comes to these kind of things, I kind I kind of grade on a curve. I do like that it's that it's it's significantly well um formatted compared compared to some others, um. And I think I think it could. Pro- I think you could do. With, I think you could do with um with a little with a little bit of of um color. Okay. Um, yeah. Sim- simply, simply because I mean every. I mean you've got things. You've got things well divided with the with the boxes, but I do. But um. When all when all that somebody has is just bl- is just black and white on on an image like this, um, I could see it kind of blending. Especially with the sheer volume of numbers, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I get and that. The um, I'd say I'd say I'd say the big I'd say the big issue is is um the is the way th- is the way things are ordered. Like when when I look at ex, when I look at Excel style spread um, spreadsheet character sheets, um, I prefer to ha- I prefer to be in the in the kind of order that one you, in that um sometimes they'll sometimes there will be a tab specifically designed to be the designed to be the character sheet char- version of it, and then sheets for and then sheets for the different um, steps. Is, yeah. is something is something that I've seen. Um, there's a there's a, a character sheet I have for Shadowrun Sixth Edition in Excel that does exactly that. Where you I would be interested of... to see that we've uh, that's the edition of Shadowrun that we've most recently been playing, yeah. and getting good character sheets for that is not easy. No, no, it isn't. This ex- <laughs> this Excel this Excel sheet is the one that I use because while there's a few form fillable sheets for Shadowrun Sixth Edition, um, there's all there's always something wrong with it. Um, and when it comes when it comes to 
when it comes to, when it, the other the main reason that I bring that kind of thing up is I do f I do feel like I do feel like having the um having the sk maybe it's just me but I feel like the I feel like the the uh, part where attributes are and the parts where skills are should probably be flipped since people's people's brains are go are going to be wired to looking towards the top um the top left first Yep. That's just that's just that's just how it is. That's why when somebody's reading manga, they have to put in the disclaimer about that you're supposed to be reading this right <laughs> to left. Yeah. Um. <laughs> and the there's also there and because of because of that when the when somebody does the eyeball test with this, the first thing they're going to see is the skill list. When if somebody's doing creation, the first thing that you'd probably want them to be looking at is the um is the is the is the attributes first. Yeah, that's uh that's that is useful. Uh, so obviously we've got we've got the the choices tab at the moment, which is kind of geared towards only certain things. Which, to be fair, maybe we should move some of the there, there are a couple of drop downs on the main character sheet which probably shouldn't be there now that I think about it. They should just be also be in choices, and the choices should be the first tab. The logic behind skills being on the left under normal circumstances is obviously because you don't really use the attributes that much during play. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas your skills, uh, with it being a, a skill based game, is e everything is uh, kind of tied to those. So and so that is. A useful, useful thing to consider, though, is the potential. I don't, I don't know whether maybe I can do something with the, the attributes being vertical down the left-hand side or something. Very again, that's a very a fairly D and D or a Pathfinder character sheets typically do that sort of thing, don't they? But um, actually, when it came, when it came to the whole attributes going vertical, um, D and D and Pathfinder isn't what I was thinking of. No, uh, I was think I was thinking of um, Warhammer. And Warhammer Fort, and specifically Warhammer Forty K, because they they've, uh, done, they've done that. Now, um, Death Watch didn't do that, but I was going to say that Death Watch is the main Forty K one that my group played, so that's probably why I was, as, as you said, I was thinking, uh, I can't remember that, but that I've, makes more um, sense. I've played, I've played all, I've played all of them, and um, I do remember that earlier versions of Dark Heresy did do the vertical approach. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, obviously, you think again. My for vertical. My main experience is D and D. You have the whole thing of your your attributes down the left, and then the skills that correspond to them down the left, which would would have been a nice thing to do. But because most of the skills in Overture are tied to multiple attributes, that wouldn't quite work. Um. But it's at the same time, yeah. It's it's mostly about getting it so that the right information is in the right place for general play, isn't it? And I think that is definitely still a thing that I need to work work out through hopefully play tests. My my group will be able to. So at the moment, I've got one group that is play testing. Right, I, I don't know about right this second, but right now they're doing some stuff, and then I've got. A few other groups that are lined up to do playtesting, hopefully late March or probably April. Um, I'm hoping that I'll be slightly further along with getting some of the sort of crossing of T's and dotting of I's done for all the core stuff by that point. Um, so yeah, hopefully that'll be where I can get some some good feedback on what's important to have on on each page in the character sheet because as i say my intention will be to move over to a pdf character sheet at some point and when i do that i would you wouldn't get everything that's currently on a single tab in the excel sheet into a single pdf page i don't think not without being really cramped anyway mm -hmm. and the now, when it comes to the spells and inventory tab, um, I uh, did I didn't focus on those too much because I think that I think um that's still a work in progress. Yeah, definitely. Um, when it, I'd say I'd say um, 
I'd say between I'd say between the two of them the the um spe the I'm not I'm not a hundred percent I'm not a hundred percent on the on the way the on the way the spell setup is written, especially get especially given you are going to have some spells that are going to be a little bit more complicated than that than that box is going to allow. Yeah. Yeah. The um, I have got some some example characters that are filled in. The at the moment the way the spreadsheet set up is it will just um. They're set to wrap text, so it will expand. So each, each effectively spell card will be bigger or smaller based on the size of the actual spell that's been pasted into it. Because um, so I, I guess, yeah, I could have it so that you have separate cells for each each part of the spell. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is that obviously a lot of people are going to want to be able to just copy and paste the spell out of the book. Um, or at least that, that's kind of my expectation. Obviously, I could go crazy and have um, again once it's in a PDF, I could I could use JSON and some JavaScript to have it so that you it does some looking lookups and will grab the particular spell based on a drop down or something. I guess, but for the time being, I'm assuming that people will just be copying and pasting out of the books. Yeah, but e either way, now um, I realize that. Overture is in a state of active development, but <laughs> yeah. What? But um, when do you th when do you perceive the next update to be coming along? Um, so the way that I've been kind of doing it at the moment is the up the version number is a little bit misleading. There should probably be a second, uh, I suppose, yeah, a, a second dot on there. Um, I, I do small updates on a pretty regular basis based on the, the kind of feedback I'm getting from playtesting um, or based on just me actually getting some time to to work on pro on it. Um, so I guess maybe a better question would be around when will the next major update be done? And for me, the intention for that is that will be the the version that I will use for playtesting. So that will include the remaining culture traits, because at the moment, some most of those don't have a, a trait. And it will also hopefully include all the remaining spells. I've got a pretty big spell to-do list to bring all of them up to the same sort of number of spells that you've got for illusion and uh, biomancy, I think, are the two that I've got the most spells at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that will need to be in that, obviously, for playtesting, um, will be a, a significant update to the bestiary. At the moment, the ad the adversaries chapter has very very limited list of enemies in it, effectively, um, and the NPC creation rules are probably about seventy percent there. You could probably use them, but there would be there would be some blank spots you'd have to improvise on. Um, so that needs to be finished as well. Um, so as I say, that's that's what I'm planning to have done for probably the end of March. Uh, now I'll I'll certainly be looking forward to see, to seeing how it how it develops and <laughs> and um, potentially how people find new and interesting ways to break it because these things are inevitable. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I had one person message me directly and just say. Uh, I can't. I won't necessarily describe, say exactly the words used, but they basically asked if they could they could uh, bend the system over and have their way with it. And yeah, it was it was an interesting message that I had. I've got to say, but uh, <laughs> they actually came back to me and said that most of the things that they initially thought of from the the sort of brief scan over it, I'd managed to already cover to stop it. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I'm a hundred percent aware of the fact that there will be things that people will be able to do to break it. Um, one of the guys in my group, uh, he's actually my best friend in real life. Incidentally, he has an amazing ability to pick up a rule set. It might take him a little bit longer to learn the rule set than it does for myself. I'm usually pretty quick at learning new rule sets, but he will somehow manage to draw lines between rules that you wouldn't even think about them potentially being linked and come up with the most obscene disgusting combinations of things it's it's quite impressive to be honest but hopefully he'll be uh, really invaluable for playtesting that will mean mm -hmm. well with that with that all said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity 
no problem at all. It's been it's been fun. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say okay. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Wicked. That sounds good to me. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!